Okay, now on to issue three. This week, President Vladimir Putin of Russia introduced a number of major constitutional reforms. Analysts believe the long-serving Russian president intends to use these reforms to ensure his grip on power extends beyond the end of his term in 2024. So Clarence, we've seen President Putin as the great sort of survivor in Russian politics, the new czar. Mm -hmm. Do these reforms posit any challenges for us in the upcoming election or in the longer term? Uh, well, as far as, as far as direct challenge, I don't see it, but uh, I see a challenge in the same sense that, that uh, his past maneuvering to get back in, into office after, after leaving, putting, putting his, uh, his subordinate uh, in charge, shows you a pattern. I think he's jealous of, the, of, of China's president. He wants to be Putin for she, life. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah that's what, what, what he's working toward. And he doesn't want to get whacked. Yeah. Yeah. There, uh, Russia's no challenge to the United States economically. Russia's can be a challenge to the United States geopolitically, and there's no question that Vladimir Putin, in the 20 years he's been in power, has raised the profile of Russia, and he's a respected figure now. I mean, everybody in the Middle East, from Israel to yeah. Syria, Lebanon, wants to talk to Vladimir Putin. But I think he wants to extend, I mean, he wants to protect what he's done for Russia in restoring it, and I think he wants to get his economy moving along. But as for a challenge to the United States or China, well, it's not in the cards. Okay. Well, his term is up in 2024, but he's not going anywhere. Uh, he's been in office since 2000. He kind of uh, traded jobs with uh, Medvedev so that he was the prime minister, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, and then he came back to the presidency. And he's the constitutional reforms. They look good on paper. He weakens the presidency after he leaves it, right. and he strengthens uh, an they advisory counsel. body, yeah. uh, which, and, he will serve. which he will serve <laughs> exactly. So this is a very clever way to extend his his time in power. And uh, the analysis about it has been interesting because there were the other options were: do you just do away with term limits and declare yourself president for life, or two, he actually seriously considered becoming the president of. Belarus, right. <laughs> which is uh, aligned with the with uh, Russia, or uh, and then yeah. that I guess they decided that was a bridge too far. So I, I think it's very clever. Um, what what does it say to us <laughs> mm -hmm. that uh, we have an authoritarian figure in mm -hmm. the White House right now, and um, he's not going to go quietly. If he if he should lose, <laughs> yeah, but he'll have and, to go. Uh, he'll, I he'll think have he'll to have go. to go. <laughs> so yeah, I think, I, I'm holding on him. to that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I think we're confident Trump is not going to stay or be able to stay if he loses. Uh, Alexander, one of the things we saw in these constitutional reforms is a ban on senior government ministers and prospective presidential candidates having foreign residency and foreign ownership rights, which I think is probably because the CIA mm -hmm. has been recruiting too many high-level Russians. But do you see in these reforms a signal from President Putin uh, that he not simply is intending to retain his power, <coughs> but through that power carry on some broader project? So the, the policies in the Middle East, for example, do you think it's geostrategic as well as his own so, so selfish personal interest? They're connected, right, because so much of his policies have been about self-enrichment, um, according to what we've read publicly, and muzzling whatever potential opposition is out there. So this is his version of a succession plan, uh, as, as uh, Eleanor was identifying. You know, he's, he's, Putin, in a way, is Nixonian in a good sense. He's very concerned <laughs> about foreign policy. This head of the state council I think he's going to offload a lot of his responsibilities on the, on the president, on the, on the others in the government, and he's going to protect his legacy in foreign policy. And that's where, that's where he's going to remain. That's where his interests are. And you know, if you take a look at the last 20 years, we have not had a major confrontation militarily with Russia. And part of the reason is Vladimir Putin, I believe, does not want that. He fought in Georgia, but somebody else provoked it. You know, he's in Ukraine, but we sort of provoked that when we pulled Ukraine out of his orbit, and he's moved into the Middle East when he was invited there. So I look upon him, he's a czar, authoritarian, nationalist. However, we can live in the world with these people. Well, I'm, uh, yes, we can live in the world with these people, but I don't have as benign a view of this. I mean, I think he's, uh, he moved into Ukraine against uh, foreign in, or international norms. I think he's looking for other opportunities. That's why the Baltics are very nervous about him. 
And I don't think he's, he's done such a great job in Russia. I mean, their economy is the pits. Their economy is smaller than Italy's, I think. That's pretty pathetic. He does remarkably well in their opinion polling, though, of, of, yeah. of the Russian people. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that's, that's lately. Putin. Yeah. Lately, yeah, which, which are not new, okay. as, as you know. All right. but, but, but Putin really cares about his people and the support he gets from them, mm -hmm. uh, which means the only threat to us that, that I see is he likes to sow chaos I, in democracy. I do think of it. it shows that he, he's not so bad. He's losing some popularity with the pension reforms, though. Yep. And mm -hmm. uh, as with Skripal, you have to keep an eye on him. Anyway, mm -hmm. in another foreign policy development this week, the U.S. and China signed a phase one trade deal. It suspends the introduction of new American tariffs and reduces existing tariffs in return for a Chinese commitment to increase their purchases of U.S. goods. But more complicated issues of intellectual property rights and contract law and keeping the Chinese to their word are yet to be addressed. Those will be front and center in phase two negotiations now set to begin. Alexander, on this sort of China situation, do you see a positivity there for President Trump in domestic politics? And secondly, do you see this as a serious economic deal that will have some legs, or is it just sort of paper? Yes and no. Okay. Yes, it benefits him, easing the tensions. Uh, he will win on the coattails of what he perceives and what he hopes his supporters will perceive and their friends as a big boom in the stock market. Uh, whether that is registering at home on Main Street is another question in Ohio and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan. Um, is it part of some grand strategy? I don't know how you can run up a budget deficit the way he has uh, and have any concept of economic soundness. Uh, the economy is doing pretty well, isn't yeah, it? I, yeah, if you want to think in the short term, sure. And, and look, I mean, it's, it's not a long-term projection. How that configures with China and our relationships right. matters ultimately in terms of the soundness of the American economy. You know, well, you've got to give Trump credit in this sense. He's the only American president in the last 20 years since George H.W. Bush. It really took up this issue of unfair trade with the United States, economic nationalism, putting American first, trying to tr negotiate better trade agreements than NAFTA and, uh, and the other ones. And I think in that sense, he's done well. But I agree this is not huge. I mean, we're going to buy 200 billion more Chinese are in good American goods over the next two years, which will help the balance of payments, balance of trade, et cetera. But the big deal down the road is whether the United States can integrate its economy with another economy where the leaders of that country basically look upon this as adversarial procedure, yep. part of the you know, global, if you will, Cold War against the Americans. I well, that. I don't think they're the only ones who look at an adversarial procedure. Mm -hmm. I think President Trump looks at it that way. And, uh, it's better that he got a d trade deal than he didn't get a trade deal. But basically, the, the reforms that he claims credit for China putting in place, they were putting in place anyway. They're probably not going to buy all of the goods that they're claiming they're going to buy. And that phase two deal, the uh, Chinese negotiator, the, 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 the highest ranking minister on this, basically said, oh, we don't think there's, uh, it's time for another trade deal. That would be like a bear uh, who's going wild in the cornfields. So I wouldn't look for a phase two to be completed before, mm -hmm. certainly before November 2020. Even, yeah. So the, the president, he talks a good game, but when actually the deliverables are peanuts mm -hmm. well, well, the or soybeans, the I should say. Here, here's <laughs> an important question of, of how, does, how does he make you feel in the upper industrial Midwest, which, which was pivotal in 2016, going to be pivotal this uh, next year. Uh, there's a strong feeling uh, uh, that that helped him put him over the top that this that, that we, we've seen the dark side of global uh, global uh, that uh, you know, folks who, who are who used to work in steel mills and auto plants that are closed now, and uh, various other, other jobs that are gone, uh, applaud Trump for just uh, st sticking up for uh, America with the Chinese, if you will, even though the dollars and cents of it don't always show that he's mm -hmm. really been that great of a, of a, of a negotiator. And, if, and of course, one of the, Pat, one of the challenges with phase two is the IP stuff, intellectual property, property, but also Huawei, telecommunications, which is China's, in my opinion, part of their project to secure right. authoritarian control of the global economy. Mm -hmm. Perhaps then it is not in America's interest to even pursue that second phase. Well, you're, you're, you're touching on the fundamental point. Is China a country which sort of, you know, cheats a bit on the rules and plays rough but belongs in the NFL? Or is this not a football game? This is a Cold War. Or this is a conflict between the two societies and countries, basically for dominance worldwide. 
and should we disengage sort of wholly or disengage so strategically? We? Well, I think they haven't made that decision What yet. do you think? I think it's going to come to that. Okay. I, I, there's too many dollars I think there's favor. a lot of room between yeah. the two scenarios you just uh, drew out. Okay, mm -hmm. Alexander, how do you see this playing out? I mean, do you think we are going to be able to fuse ourselves with China, or is, there good, is this a Cold War? If the authoritarian trajectory in this country continues to rise, then we'll be on a level playing field. In, with in, the in, Chinese in, Communist in, Party? In, in, in essence. Oh, I mean, that's a stretch, I mean, isn't it? I mean, well, look, the demagogic <laughs> rhetoric <laughs> Yeah. you know, in discourse are not just rising here. And I don't mean to hyperbolize, but the, the fact of the matter is we can play those games mm. um, better if we are more authoritarian than if we're not. Mm. Uh, because we don't have inspectors in, in China right now evaluating mm. intellectual property. And, you know, we don't have, frankly, American companies like Alphabet, Google, others who have stood up for our values. So the combination of that either means engagement at a kind of comparably authoritarian level, or like Pat Look, said, ultimately disengagement. Look, we don't have concentration camps with a million Uyghurs in them, deprogramming them from their fundamental beliefs. The idea that the United States of America, even with Donald Trump as president, is comparable to the People's Republic of China and the Communist Party, single party running that place the way <coughs> they do, ask the folks of Hong Kong if they think Trump is a little better than yeah. Or Taiwan now. You're right. Right. You're right. But we, we just have kids in cages at the border, that's all. Yeah, but we don't have millions in concentration. No, no, I'm no, talking no, about no, the no, we don't discourse. Have millions, but we're working on it. I'm talking about it. the way our president <laughs> formulates we're a trade deal. I'm, I'm yeah. talking about the unitary executive. All right. That is what I'm talking Alan, about. Alan, a quick concluding comment. Alan, 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 this would have been shocking a few enough, years enough, ago. Enough, 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 enough. There are lots of regimes out there that we don't like. Donald Trump seems to have fallen in love with the one in North Korea. So, I mean, let's separate politics policies from the way some of these regimes yeah. operate I, and, and how much we can accomplish. I, I got to say, I'm, I'm with Pat on this one. I think we're a way away from communist China.